As we began to work more with various textiles, we began to test various materials for their receptivity to laser marking and cutting. Like the 3D printed materials we've previously experimented with, we wanted to know if we could use a laser engraver to etch durable designs into the surface. For this project, we're also trying out an IdeaCam S1 Pro provided to us by BenQ. It's got some unique features we were eager to try out. We'll touch on some of them a bit in this video. For this exercise, we initially tried using the 2 watt IR laser, but it proved ineffective on most of the materials. One of our goals was to see if there was a setting we could find that could effectively mark the material without significant reduction to its strength or integrity. With the 2 watt IR laser, there seemed to be very little effect on any of the materials, so we moved to using the 10 watt blue diode laser. We set up a 9x9 testing grid matrix with speed on one axis and power on another. For this series, we set the Xtool F1 to the score setting. This allowed us to focus on power to speed ratios without having to worry about line frequency as a variable just yet. We also set up a separate test with larger shapes that were closer together. Here, we kept speed and power settings the same at 100 mm per second and full power, but instead we set groupings of these shapes to be laser scored for 1, 2, 3, and 4 passes at otherwise identical settings. We found out the black canvas we had on hand was synthetic, as evidenced by the fact that it was melting instead of burning. You'll see this later in the detail images we shot. Even so, lower power and higher speed settings with the laser didn't seem to produce any significantly visible foaming or colorization. At 100% power with speed, set at 100 mm per second, the blue diode laser almost melts a line consistently enough to fully cut through. We'd recommend a second pass at a lower power or faster setting to prevent excessive melting or expansion of the burn area. We use the IdeaCam to help us share and document our findings. Its small form factor and sensitivity to detail have made it an asset to the type of work that we do. Using it here to show the power and speed test on the black canvas, it's clear that the 10 watt blue diode laser needs to be run pretty slow at around 100 millimeters per second to have a significant effect on the black canvas. If we attach the 15x magnifier on the idea cam and we place it directly on top of the material, this macro view allows us to see details of how the different settings are having different effects, beginning at 10% power and gradually increasing to 100%. We'd recommend a second pass at a lower power or faster setting to prevent excessive melting or expansion of the burn area. We found that the olive-colored ripstop ballistic nylon predictably tended to melt. Lower power and faster speed settings visibly scored the material, but didn't seem to weaken the material enough to cause it to tear where the scoring was. When the power was set high enough and the movement slow enough to cut, the material tended not only to melt, but also to smoke and scorch. At full power and 100 millimeters per second, the blue diode laser cuts almost all the way through, since a second pass at the same power and speed scorched the material. Finishing the cut at a lower power and or faster speed is recommended. After multiple passes at full power, it's clear that the blue diode laser was also melting the ripstop outward. The more passes, the more the material between the cuts would wither away. Let's take a closer look at what's happening as the power is increased. As we progress from low power to maximum power, it's evident that the blue diode laser is not only melting farther through the material, but also farther outward. This is something to consider, especially if your design has small details that require precision. In those cases, it may be best to try lower power and more passes. Out of this set, the fabric-backed cork seemed to respond best to the laser. The line stayed sharp even with multiple passes at full power, and the cork resisted scorching. Since a lot of cork-based materials that are available are a combination of cork and another substrate, it's important to remember that those two materials will have their own properties and will likely respond differently when the laser makes contact with them. It did take multiple passes to actually cut fully through it, but the cut stayed crisp and didn't expand wider than the contact area, even after multiple passes. Even the thin lattice of material that remained between cuts retained some notable strength. Let's take a look at what the macro lens reveals. 
Moving again from low 10% power output gradually across to full 100% power application, we can see even more clearly that the burn area increases in width. This would lead us to conclude that increasing the power output not only increases the intensity of the beam, but also the diameter. This further reinforced our inclination to recommend multiple passes at a lower power setting if a design incorporates fine detail or requires extra precision. The denim spandex blend showed visible light markings at the higher end of the power spectrum, suitable enough to use the laser to apply a design to the material without compromising the integrity of the fabric. Though it should be noted that sharpness of that design can vary greatly depending on the qualities of the denim. There was very little scorching or burning when the blue diode laser was set at 100% power and 100 millimeters per second. Cutting through it resulted in some fraying, and any material less than 1 to 2 millimeters left between cuts didn't stay together. This would make sense, as the friction in the weave is likely one of the major factors keeping the fibers together. Looking closer at the surface using the idea cam, we can see that the faster speed and lower power settings result in a light mark closer to white. As the speed is slowed and the power is increased, the markings get yellower. We suspect that in the former, microscopic ablation of the dyed surface was taking place, revealing the white undyed layer of the cotton threads. In the latter, with more power applied for longer duration, actual burning of the cotton was starting to happen. We were also able to do some testing on nylon webbing strap. We did set up a new engraver file that incorporated what we had already learned regarding the viable setting window for similar material and also reconfigured the test design so that it would better fit into the proportions of the strap material. In this file, we limited the power setting variables to just 50% and 100%, but we also do more testing around the number of passes, ranging from a single pass to 10 passes. We kept speed at 100 millimeters per second. Any slower, and we suspected that the chances of excess melting and or a flame igniting would be much higher. Looking at the results, we found some interesting things. The nylon webbing was the thickest material in our testing set, so we were pretty sure we'd need more passes to cut all the way through it. And yes, a minimum of six passes was needed to get all the way through at the speed setting we were using. And for some reason, the portions of material we intended to cut away always seemed to remain attached to the edges of the holes we were cutting. But the main discovery was that more passes at lower power yielded much more accurate results with sharper, crisper corners. Then we tried to apply some of what we learned. We designed some repeating patterns, then used the settings for the results that we got that seemed optimal, and applied those together to some of the materials. We discovered very quickly that it's best to design a pattern that has a lot of forgiving negative space, and to avoid any linear elements that would require any degree of precise alignment. The more flexible the material, the more difficult it is to accurately align multiple passes with the laser engraver. Though it seems obvious now in hindsight, we ended up learning the hard way, or we had higher hopes for the precision we could achieve. But with the right design, and factoring in the properties of the material it will be used on, using the laser can result in a durable pattern that also has a tactile aspect. A more random pattern is one way to compensate for a material that may have difficult to control stretch or elasticity. It also allows you to reposition and adjust individual elements within that pattern before each time you burn it into the material. But with some practice and some experience gained, especially with the specific pattern and material you happen to be working with, we believe acceptable results with almost any pattern can always be achieved. We also realize that because the laser engraver allows fairly precise cuts, we could use that to create interface points between textiles and 3D prints. Here, we set up to cut two 7mm holes in some nylon webbing to correspond with two 7mm internal posts designed into a 3D model. We paused the print partway through so that we could place the webbing onto the posts before the print completed. This is actually very similar to the process of embedding magnets that we've outlined in a previous video. The result is a pretty strong integration between the two parts. Combining materials in your projects allows you additional functionality, features, and detail that wouldn't be possible when using the same material throughout, even on very simple projects. Here we've made some trays for small parts to help us keep things organized for an assembly we'll be doing. The magnets help to keep the trays together, 
even if we need to reposition them during the build. And the cork pads help to keep small parts in the center and prevent them from rolling around. We've also begun to use some of the output from this process exploration as refined raw material for other projects. Before we go, we've got a few closing notes. The first is something you may have already noticed, and that is that we've been working with two different laser engravers in the video. One is the original X-Tool F1, and the other is the newer X-Tool F1 Ultra. The original F1 had a 115 by 115 millimeter working area and a 10 watt blue diode as one of its two laser options. The F1 Ultra has a 220 by 220 millimeter working area and its blue diode laser is rated at 20 watts. The second has to do with laser setting specs. Any settings we're posting here should be considered more as starting places for your exploration rather than as defined prescriptions. There is enough variation between machines, even machines that have identical specifications on paper, that first attempt results can't ever really be guaranteed. And that's not even factoring in the very narrow viable parameters for certain effects on some materials. The third is a reminder that the power percentage value is set in relation to the maximum wattage of that laser. For instance, 25% power out of a 20 watt laser roughly approximates 50% power from a 10 watt laser. And even then, you'll still probably get some differences in the result it produces on the material. We hope this gave you some new insight and inspired you to try some new things. There's a link in the description if you want more information about the BenQ Idea Cam. We'll be covering a bit more on other ways we're using it in a future video. As always, if you have any questions, please let us know in the comments. Till next time.